Hi, welcome to the shop. Today, we're going to talk about hammers. Now, there's a reason for this in that uh, Jeff Warshawski came to visit this past week and he brought me uh, a gift of uh, one of his hammers. But he left me with all three of the ones that Reed, uh, his company, is selling. And um, so that got me thinking about hammers. Now, I have quite a few hammers in, uh, in my collection. And um, they all serve different purposes. You know, there's different shaped ones. Um, and uh, so it, it got me thinking uh, about the origin of the term hammer. And uh, it goes back to an old Norse... Uh, word meaning stone because of course the first hammer was just a rock in the hand to to beat something or to cut something or, 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 or anything like that and then later as the it progressed um, hammer translated loosely means a tool with a stone um, so that's interesting and of course we've had variations um, old English and different variations of the word and so it's changed over the time. But I, it's always fun to look up the etymological derivation of a word and see where it came from. Uh, because why do we call it hammer? Or why do we call it chisel? It's always interesting. Uh, anyway, that's an aside to what I was saying. Now, uh, hammers, just hammers in itself. If you look up in uh, the Dictionary of Woodworking Tools by Solomon, um, he goes into so many different types of hammers and uh, and 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 the varieties of them. This is a a great book for anybody who collects tools or even uses them to find out things. Now, um, one of the things in here, and uh, I'll show you a picture of this, is that he describes the portions of a hammer. So there's the face, the bell, the neck, the eye, which is the hole going through it, the cheek on the side, and and the pain in the back. Now. Um, What's interesting, and, and the pane could also be a, a claw for pulling nails and things like that, or a pry system. But in this case that we're talking about, um, the, the, the hammers that uh, Jeff gave me, they're really for adjusting uh, uh, plane irons uh, overall. But there is a variation of those three heads. In Solomon's book, he describes several different types. Um, in, in, in the uh, article and he notes that a lot of the hammers were named after where they came from. So in some cases you had the, uh, the Exeter and Warrington which were London patterns, pattern uh, hammerheads um, and then you had of course uh, the Warrington that had a, 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 a centered pane on, on the shape of it. So um, these variations and the names for them, they might be a little nebulous, but they serve a, a certain purpose in giving you the history of, of why those uh, heads were made the way they were made. So these are the three bronze heads by Reed. Um, and these are considered the London pattern. And like I said, a lot of these designs were named after where they were made. And so They've called this the London pattern because it's a similar design to some that were made and came from London. This is the large size. You Here. can see is uh, four and a quarter. This one here is three and what looks like uh, three quarters, maybe seven eighths. Uh, the ruler's a little upside down for me to tell you right now, but um, this one looks like three and a quarter. But this so, London pattern, heavy, heavier bronze, has an opening here for inserting a plug uh, of wood and uh, to make it a saw face. You could also put in a piece of copper or something else there. Anything that you like when you buy it, you can design it and uh, design your handle and work on it any way you want. This is the smaller one. And um, again, still the London pattern. Um, uh, but a little lighter weight. This one, I would think, I would suspect would be the best for doing plain iron adjustments and things like that. Although uh, the pain or the peen that's capable of doing are very good also for uh, setting tacks and things like that. And that's originally what those were for. The third one is a Japanese style one that he's got here. 
um, flat facets here. Um, the little bit of a taper around here, just a little soft bevel. I um, should note that uh, most of the Japanese uh, hammers are made of a steel and uh, and not bronze, so that's also another step out of the norm for So let's here. first look at these two uh, hammer heads here, both bronze, the larger and the smaller. Um, in Salomon's book, um, this, this hammer is described and pictured um, as a bench hammer. It's a, a joiner's bench hammer, which has an octagon face, a, uh, a plain pane, and a flat underside to the head. So this is the closest one that I found to this one. This one is a little different because it has this opening for a plug for a, a, a soft blow to be added. And, and I've never seen one like this before, so I think this is a really exceptional modification for this hammer. Um, notice this one here is just flat. It's a lighter hammer, and there's no real reason for a soft blow with a bronze. You're not going to be hitting very hard with it uh, in, is intentionally. Now, this one is the Japanese style, and I, I don't want to uh, mispronounce this uh, or get in trouble for that. Um, most of them are called either Genu or Geno, um, but I, I wouldn't swear by that pronunciation. Most of the Japanese hammers, carpenters' hammers that are designed like this, are flat on one side and yet uh, are, are domed on the other. And one would be for driving a nail, and then the other one would be domed so that you're less apt to damage the woodwork around the nail. They're designed with this hollow here so that um, if there's any kind of bow in it, that doesn't get in the way of you tacking in a nail on the edge here using the edge but also flat on these sides so that you can slide down some surface and tap in a nail that's very close to it and keep your hammer perpendicular to the work on that side. I've already talked so, about the plug that has to go in here and we'll get to that. Um, it's got a flat side here, a nice flat side. Uh, it has some interesting facets to it and uh, by that I mean these little shapes here. Um, and so in uh, choosing how I'm going to make the handle for it, I took into consideration those things. I could have just done a simple oval or round and come off here, but I wanted to include this and in incorporate, incorporate this into the handle, these shapes. So what I did was I took a piece of, uh, of square maple and then I cut it down um, and tapered it and I used the table saw to uh, to make the cheeks on it uh, or the shoulders for these this piece that'll match up to this and uh, I'll show you how I did that and uh, what I came up with did the shoulder here we did this all on the table saw and all we did was do the, the uh, undercut of these two here and the top to fit it so now it's real simple just to put a chisel there and just knock off that side and you don't have to worry about um, breaking out or uh, see how easy it comes off and um, you don't have to worry about going down on here and breaking anything off additional that you need. So clean that up and we're ready to fit it to the hammer, to the head. And we can see that that is good and that is good.
I wanted it to go uh, a little forward and back for support. Um, and you can see it seats nicely. But I wanted to, uh, I, I didn't want it to go square here with this nice facet. So I've brought in this curve here and relieved this section here and, um, and then tapered back down here for the handle. So these are some of the ways that I did this. Nice and snug. Then we'll put it in the microwave, see if we can get this old dry walnut to shrink a little bit, and then we'll push it in further. But that's about where I want to stop. So now that I've got this, I'm leaving this side fat because I'm going to chamfer that to the outer part of the hammer. So I turned that background in. Now I did, uh, I did put a little glue in there. Um, I think that'll help it. I still have to chamfer off these two corners, but you can see what I'm going for here is to uh, match this and this and this. And uh, so now I just need to do a little finish sanding, cleaning up, bevel these edges a little bit and mount it on the handle. So here we have at breast the handle coated in a good coating of linseed oil and left here to drip dry overnight. And here the same with the head sitting overnight to dry. But the head looks good. I think it'll be great. Oh. Overnight, the handle dried. I waxed it, did some uh, Alfie shine on it. Um, I put the head on the handle and I the, wedged uh, the uh, stem going through. And I, I'm pretty happy with it. I like this little recess here on the uh, hammer and I like the way it looks on the back here. I'll bring it a little closer so you can see what I'm talking about. Um, so here you can see there's a double wedge in there, cross in pink ivory. Um, and here you can see the carving that we did to make this join up to these two points. I, I I know it's a bit unconventional, but 
I like the way the hammer feels. Um, it's got a, a nice amount of work. The uh, walnut is uh, now on the piece. You see, I, I overlapped to the outside, so um, rather than just having a circle there, but I'm, uh, I'm real happy with it. Uh, I hope you guys like it. I'm gonna go on to the next one, and, uh, and I've got uh, that already in the works. After sighting down where this handle is going into the head, I determined that one side of it was a little bit um, was a little bit higher, so it was offset. So I used the number two plane to just come in and flatten this portion here, and uh, and uh, make sure that it's the same on both sides, um, so that when it's in the head. Um, goes this way. When it's in the head, uh, both facets are equal here and here. Now, what I'm going to do is to come back around here and round off this bottom part because most of my work here is done. The roundness of the shaving is all done. I, I like this flatness here because I'll hold it down here where it's round. So that's the next thing is to shape the bottom. So here I'm using a circle guide just to get me the curve that I want on this and I'm going to extend it a little bit right there goes to the outside so there's my mark for my rounding over there. Okay so I've cut off my waist there now I need to finish this portion here round and then I'll do a little more on the shape. Doing a little cleanup, a little cleanup of these curves with a spoke shave. Not taking a lot, but just you can feel wherever it's rough and bringing that curve a little higher onto this part here. I haven't yet determined how round I want to make the bottom. Um, this part here. I think it'll just sort of flow as I get to that. And um, we'll see how that feels. This part's feeling kind of nice. So here, I think I've got the shape that I like. So I'm going to stop here, rounded this part here, and it feels comfortable in my hand. So now, I'm just going to wipe it down with some mineral spirits to check out the grain to see if there's any flaws that I want to correct now. And um, so I go over the whole piece with the mineral spirits and it'll show up little flaws. But you know what? It's kind of, well, right here I can see that I want that more beveled, that little edge there. And it looks like there's 
a little more sanding that needs to be done there. Um, the shape of the handle, I'm pretty good with. I like the feel of it, so I'm not going to change much there. I'll just do a little bit of cleanup beveling this edge a little bit more. And uh, actually, I like this one better, so maybe I'll just flat sand this a little bit more. So the wedge is in, and I've coated this with this first coat of linseed oil. So it'll have to dry overnight. So I've got it arranged in a vise this way so that if it wants to run or drip at all, it can. And um, I like the shape of it. It'll be interesting to see how it works out tomorrow. So on this teak one, I just used a saw and I cut in the side shoulder on it. And now I'm just using a chisel to pare down for this part. Now this is a tapered hole. So the top is, uh, is larger than the bottom hole. So I'm fitting it to the top. And then once I fit it to the top, I'll know that it's tight enough to go in through the bottom. That's nice. Now I need to take it in this way. The teak is a very oily wood. You know, once you have your form, um, all I'm doing here is taking off the rough spots and starting to shape round. Um, now this is using a uh, a Stanley round bottom. spoke shave and the flatter areas in here you can use a 151 but in these curves you need to go with the round bottom We're getting there, but let's see how the shape is coming along. And uh, this is the only area that we've sanded, so looks like it needs some touch ups and stuff, but. Not too, not too bad. So I've got it wedged with a teak strip. And um, because it's teak, it's such an oily wood, it doesn't take the, uh, the uh, linseed oil very well. So you have to put it on in thin coats and wipe it back off. Otherwise, it'll just bead because there's already so much oil in the teak. So... Um, but that's neither here nor there about these hammers. So uh, hopefully when this dry, we'll give them a test and um, see what we think. So nice and dry. Let's cut off the tang using a, uh, a flush saw for that. 
and just riding right along the edge of the hammer. Flip it over. Do that side. There we go. Let's see how that looks. Not too bad. Clean that up a little bit and uh, wax it and see how she shines. Now when you apply Alfie Shine, um, an important thing is that you allow it the time to dry. And sometimes it can take a day, sometimes it can take two days. Um, you just have to really allow it that time. Um, make sure you get it everywhere. It doesn't take a lot, and um, the trick really is to spread it out so you get everything everywhere there. And it, it won't hurt to get it on the uh, bronze either. Spread it nice and evenly. You really don't want any major buildup on it. And that's it. So, I don't think it'll hurt to put a little bit right here either. I don't think that would hurt at all to have a little bit on the end grain of the teak there. So, we'll let that all harden nicely. And we'll pick it up tomorrow. I think that's looking nice, though. I'm pretty happy about it. Here they are. All three hammers. All handled. One in white oak. One in maple and one in teak. Over here, you see a rawhide hammer. And that is the hammer that I always use to set my irons and, uh, and tap the wood because there's no way that this is going to damage the wood. And it takes a certain amount of touch, you know, when you're using this, you're used to a, a sort of sharp little wrap. And these three are different. They have a lot more heft to them, this one in particular. Um, so you want to get used to whichever you use in what kind of force you use to tap your iron. Um, and you'll always want to, if you're tapping the front of a wooden plane, always want to use either the wood, which makes this a very useful hammer, or rawhide. I would never hit one of those with with one of these, although I'm sure there are people that do. It's got a nice weight to it and everything, but um, uh, I, I, I would be hesitant because I wouldn't want to damage the planes. So I've got a few planes here to show you that are all planes that do not have any kind of advanced uh, system for extending the iron in further and they also don't have a lateral adjuster. So all of these planes, when you're using them, you need to tap the iron or move it in where you want them. Depending on the plane that you use would depend on what hammer or mallet you're gonna use. Um, it's interesting that the uh, distinction between hammer and mallet, mallets are, are uh, generally defined as, as a hammer that uh, has wood, a wood face to it. So we could call this large one a, uh, a mallet. So on adjusting these uh, uh, planes, and I don't need to show you all of them, there are different places that you tap them. You would tap them forward to advance the iron. You tap in the back to withdraw the iron. You tap the wedge to tighten it before you use it. You tap here to loosen the whole system. And, um, and the wood on this, is really good because you're using wood to wood and that's what my preference is uh, in any of this. 
This small one would be nice for adjusting smaller planes and irons, I think really comfortably with this one here, it's really good because I can get right there where the iron is right against here. So, so that has a, a, a distinctive uh, use on its own, the smaller one. The Japanese one has quite a bit of heft to it and, uh, and none of these require a lot of force. So you're not pounding them, but um, you do have to adjust them when you're doing a shaving. If, uh, if you're getting only one side of the cutter, you need to tap the iron this way. Um, and when you do that, it might change the depth. So the hammers are all uh, going to be useful. Let me set this aside and just uh, let you know, first of all, I, I'm not doing this at all uh, with any compensation from Reed or from Wood by Wright, who is selling these. And, uh, but they're a fun project. Um, I like all three. Honestly, uh, this is the one that Jeff gave me, and I would have been satisfied with that. But uh, I, I, I really like the smaller one for smaller uses. Uh, and you could use it as a tack hammer as well. Uh, it's perfect for that. Um, the Japanese one I'm impressed with, I never had one like this. And it's really got a nice weight. It's almost like you just drop it like a sledge and it will do, do, do some really nice work. So I, I like all three. But that could be a little pricey for some, so I would suggest that, um, depending on what size planes you use and everything, I would suggest buying um, maybe the one with a wooden face that you can add or you can change. If you ever damage it, you can take it out and, and change it. Um, the Japanese one is just fun. Very simple to make a handle for. And uh, the little one for smaller planes, I think is useful too. I think all three are useful. I think Jeff Roshofsky has really come up with something really nice and a fun project to work on. So uh, uh, simple, um, creative. You don't have to make a handle like everybody else's handle. You make it to suit yourself, what feels comfortable to you. And uh, I think they're pretty nice. Uh, they're 100% bronze. Uh, and uh, so you, you'll, they'll never rust on you or anything. And, um, and they're soft enough to do the job. So that's about all I have to say. Uh, I, I could go through all these planes, but I, don't, I, I think I've already occupied your time enough. And I don't want to uh, have people shutting off the video out of boredom. And that's why I've edited a lot of the stuff that I've done down in the making of these. But I think you get the gist of what's required. And uh, I hope you come back to the shop soon. I enjoyed having you here. I always enjoy sharing whatever information I have or my opinions on these things with you. And I'm glad you come back for it. Take care.